Because COVID has had such a distortive effect on time, it's difficult to believe that less than two and a half years ago, Australia was engulfed in a natural disaster that dwarfed what we as a nation endured in World War II. It would be known both ominously and accurately as the Black Summer bushfires. Three billion animals dead, hundreds of people dead, a hundred billion dollars in damage, many of our most biodiverse ecosystems permanently wrecked, a thick foreboding fog choking our cities as the public continued on with silence of the lambs glances at one another through eyes watering from the smoke. The fleeting glance was all the communication that was needed to be said. Black summer could not be explained away with the usual land of fires and floods jingoisms. Black summer redefined what catastrophic was. Every natural disaster preceding it felt like little more than an unfavorable weather report by comparison. And it was in that thick of that apocalypse that our leader in name only, the dishonorable Scott John Morrison, decided to abandon the country he swore an oath to protect for a holiday in a five-star resort on the other side of the planet. After all, he discovered in his Nero-like ignorance while taking a photo with the Australian cricket team from his harbour mansion as the country very visibly burned behind him. A nation on fire doesn't make for the best backdrop. Covering politics for a living, it has frequently crossed my mind how someone who had reached the zenith of government, a man whose only concern and training is PR, how he could possibly think he could get away with not just abandoning the country he's responsible for in quite literally its darkest hour, but doing so after spending the better part of a decade crippling our emergency services through relentless and callous cuts, ignoring dozens of former emergency services chiefs, begging, not just Scott, numerous senior members of his government to at least have a plan for such predictable catastrophic seasons to which they responded with more cuts. It is impossible for a human being that has anything close to a sound mind to fathom the solipsism required to think that he, of all people, deserved to use the money of the parents of the children who were buoyed helplessly at sea as their communities were set ablaze while wearing masks so as not to choke on their home's ashes, that that parasite could possibly believe that he had earned a five-star holiday on their dollar. I can only think he rationalised it as some sort of dividend for the money saved from not buying the fleet of planes that Bill Shorten would have had he become Prime Minister. But then how would he justify the outdated submarines his government bought that were never built that cost a hundred times more? It had become clear well before the smoke had apparated that Scott Morrison deliberately went to Herculean efforts to permanently dishonour his most crucial of duties in order to satisfy the mildest of his personal whims. If you think there's any other explanation for this horrendous scar on the office of Prime Minister, I ask you, why else would he have attempted to hide this vacation from the public if he didn't know that it was deeply, deeply wrong? Why would he go to the length of outright denying he was on holiday right up until he was photographed sitting in a resort in another hemisphere with a cocktail? Why else would he on return, which he only bothered to do because of the metaphorical heat on him, why would he attempt to shift the blame of his vacation somehow on the leader of the opposition, claiming Anthony Albanese knew, lying about something as provable as a text message, and when all else failed, attempted to shrug off his role as the head of government, the final say on how all government services are managed and dispersed, that that role in a disaster of that magnitude was somehow disposable because he doesn't hold a hose. Anthony Albanese doesn't hold a hose either. Unlike Scott Morrison, he was not the head of government. He had no jurisdiction over the government. He could have very easily taken a holiday. It would have made no difference at all to how this vital apparatus functions. And yet in that most horrific of times, he did not spend your money on a cocktail for himself in a five-star resort. He spent it on food for those that do hold a hose. He spent his time listening to what resources those that do hold a hose need so he could return to Canberra and lobby for it. The most he could possibly do in his position that was regrettably removed from the levers of power. And as such, it is one of the sickest jokes of this election that the only work this sly leech of the public purse had done was to ensure that he could avoid work. And yet he has the gall to base his entire campaign around the question, is Anthony Albanese ready to lead? It's an old cliche, but a picture really is worth a thousand words. Never forget that while Scott Morrison was doing this, Anthony Albanese was doing this. That's a public servant. This is a man, on the other hand, who clearly believes the public is there to serve him. 
No matter how the commentary had attempted to massage this photo's impact, no matter how the public relations officer in chief himself attempted to reframe his appalling character caught on camera, there wasn't a frame in the world pleasing enough to hide the ugliness of that picture. No words could rewrite the hundreds of thousands of years of human coding that was shrieking inside us all that that man, ironic given the circumstances, is nothing but smoke and mirrors. Can anyone, even the most blue-blooded voter of the most blue ribbon sea, honestly say that Scott John Morrison would sink with his ship if he were the captain of the Titanic? Can you imagine him removing his imperial garb and running at the Turks who would breach the walls of Constantinople to give its citizens a second longer to find refuge? The president of Afghanistan received global reprehension for leaving his country during an invasion. His life was at least in danger. Scott Morrison abandoned you for a view. Fortunately for Mr. Morrison, the world was engulfed in a pandemic just a few months later. He would have been one of the few winners of it, which is surprising given his actual performance, which the media sanitised, just about the only thing that was sanitised during the pandemic. But that's another story covered in this 40-minute video. I'll spare you the bulk of it, but just know, 40 billion in JobKeeper handed to big business who didn't need it. A trillion dollars of debt and nothing to show for it because all that money was siphoned out of the country and into multinational companies' bank accounts, creating the exact conditions that caused the GFC because having avoided it in 2008, the Liberals wanted us to feel included, of course. Yet the press were able to weave a manipulation of a crisis that contemptible, that black and white, into a story of redemption for Scott Morrison, precisely because it wasn't visibly grey. When it's facts and figures, the press will hide those facts and figures, and thus it shouldn't be enlightening to discovered that the public actually thinks Scott Morrison handled COVID well. This is only because there was no chance of a firefighter refusing to shake his hand, as no one could shake hands, and that meant Scott Morrison got to take a lot of photos of him writing behind a desk. A much more suited environment for Scott, as it's easy to hide the board shorts. Well... If the press is so interested in narrative over fact, if they want to pretend Scott Morrison had some sort of character arc, that's a great photo to springboard from. That's the stage where he'd learn from adversity, not to actually govern, God no, as one of the most prominent health experts in the country so simply put it, they diligently did not do anything useful. What Scott learned was to half hide his pathological pursuit of laziness by referring to his vacations as working holidays. Perfect encapsulations of how Scott Morrison handled these most grave of challenges. But the third and final photo, I personally believe, isn't given its dues. This, taken in the third and final disaster, the floods, which Scott Morrison wouldn't even call a disaster until almost two weeks after the event, let alone send in the only government corps he had increased the funding of, while all the other frontline services have been so hollowed out by their cuts that the rescue operations in an area larger than what was hit by Hurricane Katrina was almost solely coordinated by local government and locals using their dinghies. I remember speaking to a doctor who had worked in disaster zones in third world nations telling me that their governments had far superior responses to Scott Morrison's. And doesn't that photo say it all? If there's a better summary of a Prime Minister and his impact, I haven't seen it. Protected from the protesters by envoys of police, no citizens allowed near him, just his friends in the press that he smoozes in events with your money. Doesn't want that filmed though. What he does want in the press is the third and final stage of Scott Morrison's redemption arc. Cleaning up his image of an uncaring self-serving tit that is concerned with his leisure first, his perception second, and that's it. This is the product of character moulded by leading a country through three of the worst years in living memory. The absolute limits of growth he's capable of. A better photo op. Taken far away from areas like this, a carefully staged once-over of a stage to assure the natural voting base of his wretched party that their memories of his performance in the bushfires, now as hazy as the air at the time, maybe it wasn't so soulless after all. Maybe where there's smoke, there isn't fire. After all, Scott Morrison has finally learned to hold a mop. Now permit me to reverse the rhetorical catchphrase of the Murdoch press by asking, if a Labour Prime Minister was responsible for even one of these vile acts, let alone the tawdry pantomime of image control that follows, just one, do you think Australia would have even a possibility of a hung parliament? It is our regrettable misfortune as a nation that we can answer that question with clarity, as look at who owns the press. News Corp is owned by Rupert Murdoch. 
If you need to know who he supports, he makes it fairly obvious every day on the headlines that he controls the displayed across the nation, virtually all of them. The very few headlines that are run by another company are run by Nine Fairfax. The chairman of Nine Fairfax is Peter Costello, which gee, I wonder who a former liberal treasurer of 11 years who allows liberal party fundraisers at his nine headquarters votes for. And if you think the ABC is somehow biased towards the Labor Party, it's purely because you don't watch it. The chairwoman is a long-time Liberal Party fundraiser. The board is littered with proud Liberal Party members. And hosting roles are infested with News Corp alumni. If you truly think the ABC is biased towards Labor, answer this simple question. The ABC is government funded. The government is the Liberal Party. You think they're handing out a billion dollars of your tax money to fund a pro-Labor media outlet, do you? Just to cancel out the billions in pork barreling they chuck at marginal seats, perhaps. The only other outlet that hosted a debate, Channel 7, Scott Morrison, was leaked debate questions beforehand. This is who controls information in this country. That's it. There's an old saying that the media doesn't tell us what to think, but what to think about. In this election, with that level of rank, Obvious, unapologetic ownership with a clear as day agenda like that dictating what the public does and doesn't see. Do you think a third of the population came to the conclusion that they'll be voting for an independent or minor party by themselves, independently of course? Or do you think that the tail might wag the dog? My job is to focus on media bias. I've done it for nearly 10 years, nearly every day, and yet I'm frequently tricked by the narratives they weave as they are weaved by people much smarter than you or I with unlimited resources at their disposal. The reason people are thinking of voting independent this election is because not even a salesman as good as Scott Morrison can sell a product that rank. As such, the elite have decided to make the public look through the ABC arch window this election. The frame is that they're both terrible. Scott Morrison only sending flood relief to coalition seats as some sort of perverse blackmail with their own money. Somehow, that man is as bad as this man because of choose whatever vague, contradictory slur the press have concocted that day. He's too small target. He's too risky. He's too inexperienced. He's been in politics too long. You better vote for Clive Palmer. Let's suck up as many disenfranchised voters as possible so if the Liberals can't get in, the government will be as weak as possible so that in the next election cycle, we can get back to the party of adults within one term instead of two. In no functioning democracy should Scott Morrison, a man with that abhorrent a record, be faring anywhere near as well as he is in the polls. The Liberals should have had to have disbanded and rebranded as they did in World War II because the damage they have done is worse than what they did in World War II. And in World War II, they sold iron to the Japanese so they could manufacture weapons and fire those weapons at us. That was less damaging than Scott Morrison's performance in the Black Summer Fires. The reason he is not on the ropes is because this is not a democracy. This is what is known in academic classifications as a guided democracy. The reason he was able to get away with something that, if you'll pardon the phrase, is as crystal clear as this, is because the lens you are fed it through is smoke and mirrors.